Perfect. Welcome to another episode of Africa Conversations. This conversation is in collaboration with the Art Center at NYU Abu Dhabi. We're really excited about this series. And today's guests are from Yasama the Dance Company. We have with us two uh, incredible folks from the company, Samar Haddad King, uh, Artistic Director of SYTD, who has been commissioned in the U.S. and internationally with performances at uh, in New York and all over the world at too many places to mention, but it is an honor to have you with us. We also have Amir Nizar Zarbi, uh, Artistic Director of The Walk, former Associate Director at The Young Vic, an alumni of uh, Sundance Institute Theater Program. It is an honor to have both of you with us. Uh, today's conversation is going to focus on a um, performance that's going to be happening at NYU Abu Dhabi in the coming weeks uh, called the uh, called Last Ward. And it is an honor to have both of you with us. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Um, let me start with you, Samad. I'm going to uh, ask you the first question, which is a lot of folks who grow up loving the arts um, at some point think, mm, you know, I don't know if this is going to become a career. This was a nice hobby. Um, at what point uh, did you become comfortable enough to say, no, this is actually going to be a career of mine and I care about um, the arts more broadly and uh, specifically I care about uh, dance and music and theater? I don't think that I, uh, I remember then when my father got the CD changer, you know, when you could put more than one CD, well, it was the record and then the CD and then the oh, multiple. It was a changer. huge, huge technological development. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I remember choosing the different uh, genres of music and each one, and I would put it on shuffle. And, uh, and I was quite young and just uh, doing dances and, um, you know, whatever the emotion came up and just going all for it and designing things and writing these things down. So from a young age, it was kind of a part of, uh, life. It didn't seem like, you know, you don't also think, well, maybe you do think, what am I going to be when I grew up? But that was just always a part of life. So, uh, um, there was a, 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 point where I thought about political science and going that route um, and was almost set to go that route. And then the last minute when you have to say, what are you going to study and what are you going to do? Switch to the arts. Um, so I guess at 18 made a decision, but I think it's still in, it's not an everyday question, but I do question, you know, the role of arts and the role of culture, especially when you're living in places that are still fully occupied, that what, what, is it is it worth it? You know, all of these things. So but I think the question, the, the questioning and the practice of doing that is important to keep kind of what. Yeah, the, to remind yourself of why you're doing it. So. Yeah. Nizad, what about you? Do you have a similar story um, as a kid? Um, yeah, the truth is that I. I always knew I would become a theater maker. Um, I, you know, it started from my grandfather handing me the complete works of Shakespeare at an early age, I think 14, 15, going read, that would be interesting. Um, but it was always somewhere there. I don't, I can't go, there's a moment in time where it became a decision. I think I knew from a very, very early age that that's what I will be doing, um, do you remember um, a work that really influenced you? I mean, you mentioned this book, but do you remember a specific work? Uh, and Amir, will, uh, Niza, we'll start, start with you. A work from your childhood that you thought, oh my God, this is clever in a way that is unrelenting. This is tickling me in a way that just, I can't shake it. It's so exciting that somebody made this and this is just sticking on me. Um. I think Kafka shorts was the was one of those moments where you finish reading the this group of very short stories that are so penetrating and crazy and full of life and challenging. And I was quite young. I think I was too young um, to really understand them. Um, but the fact that you can reveal a different layer of reality 
Um, I think that was one of the books, but there there were many. I think I can't again. There were so many different books that you, as a child, you go, that's who I am. You know, you read Dostoevsky and you go, that, I found my voice. I'm Dostoevsky. I know who I am now. And then, <laughs> and, then now. <laughs> you read Faulkner and you go, mm, actually, I'm Faulkner. Or you read Derwish and you go, I, I now I understand the world. I understand the world through Derwish. So, and I think this is very common for a lot of people in our craft and theater making maybe also in dance, although there's, they don't speak that much, thank God, um, is that we, we identify immediately with any influence we have. You know, we immediately embrace um, different realities. And I think that's, that's when you understand that you are going to become a theater maker or an artist. Yeah. Samad, what about you? Does that sound about yeah, it's right? It's similar. And it's also for me, uh, jumps between theater and dance, which I think, you know, if you look at Tanz Theater in Germany, there is much more of a mix in the States growing up in the, you know, early 80s, 90s, that wasn't a mix. It was kind of your theater and dance. So I, Death of a Salesman, I thought I was Willie Loman, or I, I was afraid to be Willie Loman. Um, it was, what if that happens at the end of your life? You know, this read, um, Song of Solomon and uh, Sylvie Guillaume, who's a French dancer. And I remember she, I was eight when I saw um, Not Life on a VHS tape. And I can still picture this piece that I saw of her. She has a chair and her bright red hair was kind of all disheveled and she has her leg in front of her and she's very crouched um, towards her leg that is, you know, above parallel to the floor. And she's taking her leg and it's trembling and she's making it tremble because she could hold it there for two hours and, it, 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 you know, drink a cup of coffee and smoke a cigarette and it would be fine. And um, and th this in this particular piece, she's quite panicked in fear and just you saw every single muscle was so um, crafted to to an emotion um, and specific without a word that I want to be her. Um, you know, it then it shifted kind of towards telling stories, which I think in traditional ballets, you tell stories that are a bit naff. Um, they're not that interest. Well, that's that's a, a, a statement. If you know, that's, that's fine. You can you can. Uh, it. <laughs> you know, they they serve their purpose um, and they are interesting. I think the way that they've been spoken and there's been new, re like with Giselle, uh, Akram Khan did a revamping of the Giselle and kind of a different different uh, viewpoint. So that's, that's been interesting. Yeah, yeah. But it's kind of the bridge between dance, which has, has this aesthetic to it, sometimes paired with story, but a lot of times not in contemporary dance more. So with concept and that I, I'm not, I don't really attract to, and then straight theater, which is, you know, um, very much uh, telling a story, which yeah. I do. I'm curious about whenever I uh, speak to folks who are creative partners. Um, I'm always curious about um, the origin stories because it's so hard to have uh, productive, uh, lasting creative partnerships. Um, so Samad, maybe let's start with you. What is your recollection of how this creative partnership started? You want to start with me? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, how did you two meet? Uh, <laughs> um, yes, I, I can, I exactly know how it met. Um, I was very sick on my way to New York that night. I was wearing a teal sweater with ballroom dancers and sequins that a friend had found me at a flea market. And I meet Nizad for a project, uh, a play. Um, he had it written and directed Haza. Uh, is the same and he wanted movement in it and we had been um i moved to palestine in 2010 been working here since 2007 but officially made a kind of a switch or co-base between uh palestine and new york and this was 2016 um that we and you know he I had obviously heard of Nizar and it, his was the first play I saw when I moved to Palestine. Um, and my name is uh, Yusuf and I saw it in Ramallah in 2010 or uh, 11. I think it was 11 in the spring when they were there and I saw him perform on stage that I come to find out later. Um, and yeah, he asked me to work with a group of six or seven 
non-dancing men uh, <laughs> in a show that's set in an Aza. And, uh, and it's a beautiful show. We started that then soon. Um, I think Nizad is, uh, is super visual in a way that I also there's a, a very factual thing between theater and dance. Dance has way less money. Um, so a lot of times you're thinking, um, I, I realized in meeting Nizad how limited I had uh, limited a vision of aesthetics and kind of sets and these kinds of things and working in dance because you just think about the littlest money possible. You do not put money in sets. It's like maybe costumes, but usually it's just like clothes you find. Uh, and artists and theater there is a little bit more money so um but and i think in a lot of traditional plays there's a, you know you think about the design and all of these things not saying that he was uh, sitting on gold here in palestine um but there's something so aesthetic and and uh about the way he approaches work and um there's a lot of movement within the words and within the stories i'm a very story based person so we came together and then have done we counted it's either 8 or 9 um uh to Together. And then he does the walk. I've done three in the walk um, uh, performances. So yeah, I, it's super special. I mean, um, we, we laugh, we fight, we make fun, we make fun, we make fun, we make fun uh, <laughs> and have our nicknames and have our ways, but you develop a way of working together and yeah, trust, trust is like very, very hard to find in the rehearsal space. And yeah, he's like a brother to me. Um, and yeah. I, I love my brothers. Uh, we have a good relationship. <laughs> the old adage is if you want to feel good about a theater budget, look at a dance budget. <laughs> exactly. Uh, not, not, in, not in Palestine. Even yeah. that, you know, I don't think there's a big difference. It's just a very different approach. There's a difference in approach. Um, yeah. Um, what about Anizad? I'm curious to hear your perspective on um, the the beginning of Yes Amar and uh, what you remember from those days. You know, I like someone said. I invited her to as as a, as one of many collaborators that I work with, because um, obviously in theater you work with set designers and lighting designers and musicians and. And I invited someone into the rehearsal room to investigate. A lot of the times I do the movement from my shows and my shows are very physical. Um, but on this specific show, I went, mm, maybe we can, maybe some of us, because we've been circling around each other. Mm -hmm. um, so I invited her and, and I was, I think it was in very quickly, we understood that there's a very common language and there's a fraternity, saturnity, I don't know what's the right term with, but it's also, I think one of the things that became very clear is, for me is, in the solitude of being an artist in Palestine, when you find another person that you, you trust, you trust the taste, you trust the critical thinking, you trust the, and you're also enjoying the company because that's part of it, it becomes very natural to embrace them into the family. Um, and with somebody, it was just a moment of zing. You know, we were in this workshop. It was an early workshop in trying to develop a new piece. And from the kind of two hours in, you go, okay, this is for keeps. This relationship is real. Um, and then from, from piece to piece, our, our relationship became more complete and more profound artistically so we we i think the 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 secret here is to go into the rehearsal room egoless um bring what you can listen very carefully to what your partner is bringing um take what you want give what you and and it becomes very you know when we're both focused on making a good show it's not about me or her you know i'm not part of yasama i'm a I'm a passer buyer. I'm a guest when needed, and but I'm not part of her structure. It's her company. Um, when when we created Last Word, it was produced by a Um, and that's very you know it's not territorial in that way. Part of it is, I think, 
both of us doing quite a lot before we met. We were already old dogs. Um, so we, you kind of go, okay, it doesn't really matter. We just want to do good work together and try and enjoy it because all the rest is pretty miserable. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think, it, can I just add on to Please. like that spark in the the room? I had my all my interactions, I think, with theater directors um, were very much um, from this heady place where it's all concept and you know of course you have to talk about like the what does this character want and all of these things but I remember in the first rehearsal I had told the pr uh, production manager or assistant that I, I I had such bad experiences with directors that I said I will not do anything I will not try anything um you know the first day I'm just there to observe Nizar and how he works to see if this will work out. And I remember within, I I had tried some uh, ideas by the end of that rehearsal and it was maybe two hours just because seeing Nizad, he was, you know, on his feet and um, yeah, very coming from a visceral physical place that uh, yeah, it, it felt, wow. Okay. Hey. Uh, <laughs> so it's exciting. So cool. So I want to talk a little bit about Last Ward. Um, the sort of the the context of this conversation is because this performance is going to NYU Abu Dhabi, um, and so I want to I have a little bit of a trailer um, loaded up, and so I'm going to play a little bit of it, and then hopefully we can talk a little bit about um, the concept and execution. <laughs> Um, so for those of uh, you who can't see the screen, I'll describe a little bit of what I see and then uh, both of you can sort of chime in and explain what I'm getting wrong. But um, from the description, it says, uh, last word follows one man's journey towards death in a, a hospital room surrounded by the sterile mechanisms of modern medicine. The patient reflects on his life relationship and connection to a place as a ritual of doctor visits and family calls transform into an increasingly bizarre landscape of tragedy and humor. Um, that is a, uh, a, universal um, experience, um, but it's not really a subject that is typically explored um, with this medium. Um, maybe uh, Nizad, we can start with you and then uh, Samad, I'd love to hear your perspective on, you know, where did this idea come from? It feels like it would be responding to something in your life, um, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, you're not. The, this idea, this idea came from just before we created Last Word, I spent, I think, the la the three years before Last Word, I pretty much spent in hospitals with my dying parents. Um, and when we set out to start doing Last Word, we had a very different concept. We were working with a very different way of thinking about, and it wasn't about the hospital room, and it wasn't about this. It was a completely different approach and we had three weeks two weeks i don't remember but we had a couple of weeks of research in in paris um in a residency and throughout the residency we felt something isn't gelling something in the way we were thinking isn't gelling and and i probably because i was still digesting my years in hospital rooms, that material seemed very interesting to me to start exploring. And in a way we kind of switched gears and went into this exploration. And I think that from hours from the moment we kind of went, okay, actually let's think about this. A lot of things started falling into place. Um, th this, this material is life. It's about life, really. I wrote, 
I wrote the, the, the show like you write a theater show, like you write a play. And, and in a way, in, the medium here is interesting because it's not really dance. It is dance, but it's, the structures are theatrical. The structure is a thinking structure of a theater show that is then danced throughout with beautiful uh, performances of dancers acting and of an actor who's one of Palestine's greatest actors, Khalifa Natur, um, really delving into the depth of this experience. I think there was something in, in the exploration of this material, which I, I really wanted to explore. I also think that where we come from, you know, coming from Palestine, you're almost, you're almost casted into the theatrical or dance vocabulary that you're allowed to use. And the last word was a very bold political statement, which says, you know, we, yes, we're occupied. Yes, there's a political situation. Yes, yes, yes. But death comes very gently sometimes in the middle of the night and sits by your bed. Um, and we are people, complicated, alone, frightened. Um, and we're not, sometimes we're not allowed to talk about that aspect of our reality because we're always, um, we're always rallied to a political cause or we're always chained to a political way of thinking. Um, and for me, that was kind of starting to think of last word in this way was very, very interesting because it's two very different textures. There's this machine called hospital that beeps and pumps and is efficiency, is Western efficiency at its best. And then there's a completely different scale of time, which is, um, which for me is very Arab, is very Eastern, is a very different, different negotiation. And, in, and I think that in the collaboration with someone, this really comes through in the, in the choreography. There's two sets of worlds here all the time. One very, very uh, brutalistic and efficient, and the other is much more malleable and 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 has to do with breath or has to do with with a different kind of tempo. Um, and yeah, and I think that was where I got very interested in exploring this new material that we called Hospital Room, after we were trying to explore a different material that was called Headache. <laughs> it just didn't work. Yeah. Um, yeah, it feels like there's, I, I see the juxtaposition uh, between the sort of inorganic and the organic, between the sort of uh, mechanical, um, and the the human but somewhat please uh, i'd love to hear your thoughts as well yeah i mean i was just talking uh, to someone about the work i remember my a grandmother my dad's american um and my american grandmother talking about her burial plots and my mom would mutter in arabic about um you know uh, hey, but they shouldn't talk about this. And they're talking about their bear, you know, the, these Americans are insane and they talk about death. And so, so in, in some ways also culturally to, to, to follow this man's journey, um, through the, you know, his last days isn't so much talked about, um, and what he's going through and the, what he's seeing. And he's still, he's still experiencing so much of the world. The same with Nizad. Um, I was a lot in the hospital for a different reason. I gave birth and, um, and, uh, my child had a lot of complications. So was it in the NICU for, um, a lot of that same year. So also to be in a hospital for different reasons for the beginning and the end, uh, and what you experience and the commonalities that you share. Um, but I remember, and you know, going back to what we were talking about, about theater and dance, um, we started with soil. We started with two and a half tons of soil. That's what we were. Uh, <laughs> we, we started with black dirty. And um, 
those two weeks in Paris, uh, we had a residency at the Chaillot National Theater. And um, Nizan and I knew we weren't getting anywhere. Um, so let's split up. He took a walk. He came back. <laughs> And, and I was working so with the dancer, obviously it was quite futile, um, not going anywhere, just like, and then he's like, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, uh, finish, finish, finish. Let's take a walk. Let's take a walk. And he asked me, what's the opposite of a field? Um, and it's funny in retrospect, I always think, you know, the Palestinian would be like prison. Um, but I said hospital and he said, yep. So the next day we talked to the theater, says, so we need to take those two and a half tons of soil that everyone brought down under the lower level and a hundred people helped us because the elevator broke and we need to flip it to this hospital under the sterile place. And we need to start from the opposition, um, basically. And yeah, I think that, um, as Nizaj said, it's one of the more po uh, political works or politicized works because cancer has no border and um, death has no border, but specifically death with cancer. And I think um, that's a shocking statement to see an Arab man. Um, you know, you don't really, we don't talk about place so much, but he speaks Arabic. So, you know, he's um, from an Arabic speaking country, but yeah, I think also this of the dance theater works that we had done, this was our second. And um and one thing that after we created Against a Hard Surface, which was the first um, uh, that Nizar and I did of the dance theater works, it's kind of, okay, what, what happens if it's theater show done with dance, but it's kind of like the dance is so task oriented. What is it? What is what is it that these characters want, which is not often the, the question that you ask dancers um, and when you're creating work. So the steps become a little bit less important, even though the steps are executed beautifully and um, with such precision. But the thought process behind that is what we worked on for weeks. Even before Paris, we had been three weeks, I think, in the States um, and kind of working on this thought process. And it was important because Nizad had worked, um, you know, I had been working with art artists for many, many more years in dance context. So some of the uh, artists had worked with both Nizad and I on separately before we came together. And so some of them had a clue um, of that, but most of them didn't. So it was also changing the thought process, which was in uh, interesting. Um, yeah. Can I ask a, a simple question, right? Um, this is, you know, it's a, a collaboration between both of you and all the designers and the technicians and so many people. How important is it to you that every single person that is involved, and, and in particular, at least based off the ones I'm looking at right now, the ones on stage, how important is it to you that they understand the politics and the idea behind the work? Um, maybe Nizad, let's start with you, because I, I'm curious, because on its face, maybe it's not about that you know, like, uh, at the, at the sort of surface. Um, but how important is it to you that that's fully felt and that every single collaborator understands the, the sort of bigger picture? It's, it's crucial. It's crucial and non-negotiable. I, the audience doesn't need to know. We don't give pamphlets explaining the political context of the show. Um, or what we try to achieve, or even our own personal griefs in the show. But the creators and the creators are, of course, Samara and I are part of the creative team, but we're not alone. There's everybody that's on stage are part of this. Um, they need to understand it fully in order to be able to justify it, in order to be able to breathe it, in order to be able to carry it on their way, on their shoulders, night after night, they need to own it. We are, we are mediators of, a, of an idea, but they are the executors of the idea. They need to be fully aware of what they're doing or else it will fall short. So these conversations take different shapes, different you know, sometimes you don't need to talk a lot. Sometimes you need to pass near somebody and just go, be careful. 
you're not explain you're not emphasizing this word and it changes the context and they go okay or be careful if you do this movement with the wrong energy it means something else um i think our our cast our collaborators our bigger net of collaborators are fully aware of of what this means politically or what it means on a human level or what it means emotionally if they don't they can't perform um there is you know when you're a young director um, there's a tendency to think that by withholding you retain power um when you're an old and i am now uh an experienced director you understand that the more you share the more info the more knowledge your team has uh the the more they know the better they become in supporting you to create it um it needs to become a collaborative experience and that's the beauty of theater or else i would be doing other things um the the true beauty is that it, with each one of these performers there's a very intimate conversation that is taking place and keeps evolving you know it keeps changing from rehearsal to rehearsal and and some some of them become very profound these conversations become very profound and they're two way they're not one way conversations yeah so much do you have anything to add to that i have a question for you as well yeah no i agree with everything he says it's crucial and i think yeah. also we're aligned in the fact that um in terms of yeah giving pamphlets i for me i don't uh, work from um you know teach ideology through art on stage um it's to tell a story to entertain um and i think the now of course i have my own ideologies and the principles and the ethos that i live under and i think in terms of the the cast there's in it's it's such a vulnerable space as well in a in a room and you're talking about these sensitive topics and we're also dealing with a lot of life um that is not easy going around and um around you and we have a thousand stories that um Nizar and I can tell you and we still won't finish about how life can affect the rehearsal room and can affect these works and stuff but yeah to um it, it, it you know for me I don't want to give a quiz to the audience I want to take them on an experience and I think it it requires a lot of trust with your performers as well to kind of uh um delve into that and as Nizar said you know these performances go on you don't just do one and find a way to do it and then that's your way they're constantly exploring and as executors they're constantly um uh questioning reassessing uh you know their responses live on stage as they you know we do shows um uh, so it's it's a living art it's not something that's just done and accepted box checked we can do it over and over and over again um do you I, I wanted to ask you this is performed all over the world right um and at you know death is universal but, but the way people think about death and the end of life and the way people think about the role of medicine in that process varies culturally, geographically, uh, sometimes family to family. Um, I wonder how has it felt to perform this in these different contexts? Um, Samad, let's start with you because I, I see that you're like sort of like processing, <laughs> uh, the, reprocessing those emotions, uh, and especially in the context of this is going to be performed in in Abu Dhabi in just a matter of uh, days. Um, you know, what has the sort of uh, the the feeling, how has the feeling deferred from place to place? So I think, well, first of all, this piece has not performed all over the world. It's performed oh. in New York and it will perform in uh, the uh, Arab world premieres in Abu Dhabi. However, it has gone through the creation of it, has gone been all over the world from Colorado to New York to Paris to Hekawati and um, our Palestinian National Theater uh, to Jacob's Pillow in Massachusetts. You know, so there's been a lot of um, uh, places that it 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 grew from, you know, and it was kind of so it will be interesting. However, during every single one of those residencies, we did showings in different phases of the piece. And I would say in Paris and Jacob's Pillow in Massachusetts and in um, uh, Haifa also and uh, Jerusalem at the Hakaweti, um, 
they were closer to the finished project. However, the premiere was in New York of two, uh, 20, uh, May of 22. It was delayed because of Corona. I, I think something that's interesting that happened, we started creating it in 2017. No, 2018. 2017 is when we started writing about it. 2018 is when we started creating. Then the world changed and so much of the world spent a lot of their time in hospital. And we were in the world was dealing with mass death, some places more than others. Um, I think one of our artists uh, at one point was living in front of a hospital in Brooklyn and it was one of those hospitals that it was bringing the meat trucks and, you know, just putting bodies in bags and bags and bags and bags and bags and loading hundreds, thousands of bodies per day in New York when it got hit really badly. So the context of the work changed. Um, and then the, the medical workers became heroes uh, as well. And, and, you know, of course, that that storyline of the, you know, the doctors and the nurses and the medical staff that are helping people, it hadn't come on this mass level in such a long time oh, uh, throughout the world. So that also had a, con a you know, change of um, idea for the world. And in this context in the piece, the, he enters this functioning place. Now, even during Corona, there was this factory-like thing because people were being sick and dying en masse. Um, but it had just a different context uh, for the world at that point. So I think it will be interesting there. I don't, I, you know, Nizad, chime in if you disagree, but I don't think there's a huge commentary about, yes, uh, you know, whether people go into a Western hospital or what type of medicine they use. That, of course, there's differing opinions in different cultures and indigenous cultures and um, and different religions and what they believe with it. We don't really get into that. I mean, it's as simple as you are going to die in a few days this is what happened. You know, this is where he's dying and this is what he's thinking about and the kind of journeys that he's going th through. Um, so I, it, you know, while it may be a specific form of passing um, in an actual place, I, I don't know necessarily if I, it would have to be performed or in places to understand um, that. You, you know, I've, I've been, lucky or i don't know if lucky is the right word but i've been lucky enough to perform my works for the last 20 years all around the world um the 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 aesthetics change from place to place but i think that if a piece is honest uh and the core themes the the what what you have to say is honest it doesn't then the the cosmetics the aesthetics the setup the design the are they wearing white robes or yellow robes becomes almost insignificant because we are exploring honoring trying to understand a human experience mm -hmm. and the one thing that is the same everywhere from chattanooga to to lagos is we all die. We're all afraid. We're all alone. And we're trying to work our way through these basic elements. Um, so you think of Chekhov, who created in, in Russia in the 18th century, and his plays are completely about me today in Palestine or London, where I am right now. But they are about me because they capture, they honestly capture something about who we are as creatures, and we haven't changed that much in these last 200 years. We want to say we did, but we still are the same. Um, and it's very interesting to see shows that tour internationally on a wide circuit, where you go to very different cultures. And But if the show is honest, people people find find that the important thing. And then, and then the the difference in aesthetic or culture becomes an added layer of curiosity, but it doesn't work unless the show has an honest sharing about human beings. Yeah. So let me ask you a question because you, you've mentioned like Chekhov and all this uh, stuff from all over the world. Um, I, and, and you mentioned having this, uh, you know, uh, excellent Palestinian uh, performer who is a part of the cast. 
And this is going to be a cheeky question, but it's intended to be a cheeky question. Um, Cheek away. Yeah. Does it feel like um, through your work, you're sort of broadening the, the, the sort of definition of what Arab or Palestinian theater can look like? Um, or do you feel like, screw the label, I don't care, we're not making Palestinian theater or Palestinian performances. We are making art. We happen to be in New York and happen to be in Palestine. We happen to be in London. We happen to be wherever, but screw the label. That's not what we're doing. Um, I am a Palestinian. I'm, I'm a Palestinian. I'm a theater director from Palestine. Um, I work a lot with Palestinians, not exclusively. Some of the casts are and creators are completely Palestinian, and then it's a Palestinian show. Um, is it redefining what what Palestinian theater can or should, or w maybe that's not my role? Others will go. Mm, when we saw that, that made us think differently. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that we are able. And when I say we, it's Samar and me and lots of other amazing creatives that live in, in a very hard circumstance to be creating art in and are still able to create amazing, challenging, um, cutting edge works that perform internationally on the highest level and in the biggest stages and are not performing there because, um, because it's occupied theater, they're performing there because they are good pieces of arts. And I think that's where throughout my career and that's where me and Samar meet very closely is we're very proud of the fact that we're Palestinians, but it's not a cage, it's a, it's a launch pad. Meaning me being Palestinian doesn't mean that I'm, uh, caged by the definitions of what Palestinians should or shouldn't be talking about. Uh, me being Palestinian is me tapping into my huge resource, cultural resource. Um, you know, I live on a land, lived on a land that goes back in millennia like no other. Uh, you put your hand in the ground and stories start coming out. Um, because we are layers upon layers of cultural accumulation from Solomon the Great to Solomon the Grand, you know, <laughs> everybody. Um, I'm very lucky to be coming there. Right now, the last wink, historical blink of the eye is our story as occupied, but that's, you know, my grandmother wasn't born occupied. She was born on a different time with a different um, understanding of reality and geography. That is part of me. I don't want to define myself only by our occupiers. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, they're part of the definition, but they're not the sole definition. Um, yeah, beautifully said. Uh, someone, do you have anything to add to that? No, um, again, it's, I create art just to entertain and entertain may have a bad connotation, like, oh, just to laugh and enjoy and eat popcorn and, you know, to tell a story, to move people. That's a far, uh, you know, form of entertainment. It's not to give people, um, a lecture, um, on what it is to be a Palestinian. Also that, I mean, you can't do in an hour. We're a very heterogeneous uh, society with many different thoughts, with a different, uh, many different, you know, uh, yeah, ways of living and being in the world. And I can't also represent um, an entire people. No you one- can't, you, can't, you can't be honest when you're representing. Oh. Exactly. And so some people, I think the thing is people, yes, I would agree. I would agree that we are changing. I think Nizar's work separately of the work we've collaborated on, um, because I've been in the audience and I've been with people. And I think the work that I've done solo and the work that I um, done collectively with Nizar, with the company also work uh, elsewhere. Yes, it changes because I do feel people have their stereotype um, uh, about what they think a Palestinian is. We've been, we've been on in 
in the news for quite some time for the past, you know, 70 plus years. So people have an idea of what they think that means. And so they see artwork and maybe it changes. So great. But again, that's not what's driving me to put me on stage. What's driving me to put on stage is like to give my mother a journey. She's Palestinian. She knows who she is. She doesn't need me to teach her who she is. <laughs> Except I teach her how to do masachin because she's a bad, <laughs> she's not the best cook. Uh, <laughs> Oh, somebody's going to be in trouble. Yeah. I, I won't tell her that this is a... <laughs> no <problem> for you. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I think there yeah. is a... I, I, I want to say something about this work that I think is important. Um, when we did the showing at Jacob's Pillow, I think uh, when we had a QA, and uh, a it was the first time I had been in a Q&A in a long time where... The fact that we were Palestinian didn't come up and only one person was trying to dig at the fact that the soil had something to do with Palestine and the land. And this was someone that I come to find out had worked, had tried to bring the Freedom Theater at some point to New York. And there was this big uh, cancellation and a big fight going on in the 90s. And um, and so he had a uh, understanding of and had been to Palestine and all of these things. And so he was fishing. Uh, he was trying and and we and we laughed and Zod and I in the thing we're like you're fishing right now um but it was something that people were um really blow I think blown away because they personalized the story you know I think most art is either uh, a door that you walk through and see kind of a different world or a mirror um and uh you know in that door you can see a different world you can try different paths you can think different ways I mean it but it's something different or something similar that you see yourself on stage or you see your experience even if it's a little bit different and I think that was uh, you know, in terms of the changing ideas about Palestine, yeah, I think it does. But is that what drives me to the studio? Absolutely not. Very, very cool. I want to ask one last question before we wrap up and do the uh, Q&A. Um, you had mentioned that you started thinking through this project 2017, and then it uh, it takes time for it to sort of cultivate in your head, and then you start working on it, then you you know go to all these residencies. Um and you've worked on many different projects. The first project that I uh, came across was the Little Amal project, right? Um, uh, which toured all around the world um, and was a huge success um, by many, many metrics. I wonder, so maybe uh, Nizar, I'll ask you this question. How hard is it to sort of shift between mind frames? Because maybe you started working on uh, with Little Amal, like, I don't know, uh, a decade ago, for example, but me as the, as sort of the public, I'm still engaging with this. You're still asked to talk about it. How easy is it to sort of shift back and forth between these different projects and these different mind states, um, as an artist? It, it's, I, I think it's, there, there's, I, I kind of want to separate them into two phases for me. There's the phase of the actual creation. Uh, and then you're a bit kind of you're single tracked and you're creating something. It's like you're literally you're doing that and you can do other things. And then there's the phase before, which could be a long period where you're collecting your ideas and you're thinking and you're working simultaneously on six or seven or nine or 12 projects where some of them are in different stages of development. And we can, you know, it's sometimes they're fer they fertilize each other. Sometimes they're completely, but they give you different, um, different places to run away to. Um, <laughs> so when you are creating, when you're in the studio with your artists creating a piece, it's very hard to think of anything else. Um, and it is, or when I'm writing a new play, it's all consuming. I hardly read books. I don't see anything else. I even find it hard to see, see other people's work. Um, but once the show has been brought to life, then it's basically, it's a different relationship. You're now making sure that your baby is walking and not falling flat on its face. And it's, but it doesn't take that much um, creative energy because you've, you've done it already. Um, 
So th there's almost three phases. One is a very long um, period where you're 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 thinking, you're contemplating, you're starting, you, you have inklings, you start to develop them, you write endless drafts and throw them to the garbage, and but you're not there. And then there's, in, in my writing, it's literally like that. There's months where I stare at the computer, and then there's two weeks where I bash the play out. And if somebody talks with me during these two weeks, it's his responsibility. It's, I don't know, but I literally become sharp and focused and the minute the play is out it becomes somebody else's problem almost um yeah super interesting um okay i want to jump into the quick q a um and then we'll wrap up so the first question um i'm actually going to skip the first question because we have two people so it's going to take twice as long let's do the second question which is who would you love to shadow for a day past or present someone will start with you and then we'll do an ease that's like asking someone, what's your favorite film? And then you yeah. what's a film? Uh, <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, I see what's a person. Uh, who yeah. would you love to shadow for a day? Uh, I don't. Really, Samar? Yeah, I don't know. Many possibilities. I mean, there is, it's like for Dostoevsky, that was the first thing that came to mind and be like, what is that brain around? You know, yeah. <laughs> just to see how does he wake up in the morning? What does he think about? Um, there, that's mine. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> is that what about you? You know, I'd go straight to 1599 and spend a day with the old bard um, walking around Elizabethan England with Shakespeare should be a treat, even, yeah. but just for one day, I don't want to get stuck there. Get the plague or something. Uh. Yeah. Niza, since we were talking about this, and since you, you've you mentioned Shakespeare twice, uh, let me ask you, what's the most underrated Shakespeare play? The un most underrated? Yeah. Um, that's a tricky question when it comes to Shakespeare, because they're usually very... Rated. Properly rated. Um, but <laughs> I, I think there's, I'd go two, for two that are very different. I think Comedy of Errors is totally underrated and is read very, very superficially usually. And the other one that I think is a pure act of genius and it doesn't get enough is Pericles which is such a gorgeous play and so complicated and so full of meat and and again is hardly done it's a it's a complicated play to do but in today's world it needs to be done more often than it is cool um okay so someone we're going to start with you again um what do people most misunderstand about your work Oh, I, I, again, this, I don't, I, 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 that question doesn't come up a lot. I mean, I would say that the, it's not even misunderstanding at first. It was kind of how to watch dance, particularly contemporary dance in Palestine. Um, but it, it was never, I don't get it. Um, again, because I deal a lot with narrative and pretty clear narrative and text, even before working with Nizar. So um, I think it was pretty clear. Uh, I think one larger concept of YSTT and the company that I lead is that they expect to see Palestine, Palestine culture, uh, to Roth, like the folkloric um, uh, mediums on stage. And I think that's the shock, um, most more than like thematic uh, or I don't know, uh, misunderstanding. Yeah. Nizar, what about you? What do you think people most misunderstand about your work? I, I think, again, humbly, I think the work is understood. I think what people misunderstand is the amount of painstaking labor yeah. it takes to create 
an hour, a minute on stage, people go, ah, oh, it's easy, but it's that. And I can, I can be an actor. And you go, in order to repeat this movement precisely time after time, it takes the same uh, res relentless belief that it takes a brain surgeon to crack open a skull. I know that's, that sounds very, very, but it's the truth. Like in any work that you are creating something that you honestly believe is important for this world, we take our work very seriously. I think that sometimes there's a misunderstanding of the process. Mm -hmm. um, the result, I don't know. If they misunderstand, I'm sorry, but that's what that's, I'm doing my best. <laughs> I'm not responsible for that. <laughs> um, and the last question is, um, I'm going to change it. The The standard question is, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? I'm sure there's a long list of th uh, things. Outside of theater, outside of the performing arts, um, what is a well that you both can go to regularly to find inspiration? So not, you know, outside of your field entirely. Um, but where do you go to find that spark when you're coming up dry? I go to history, but I don't, I think it's also connected, you know, in some way, everything's connected to the arts. Um, but, uh, yeah, history, um, just historical periods, especially people in, um, uh, yeah, not, not, I would say probably 17th to tw 21st century. Um, uh, yeah. How people problem solve. Um, is so interesting to me that also how people deal with um, extreme uh, trauma and survive and thrive uh, throughout the course of history, especially when there was different resources available um, that made it harder. I find that completely, uh, I mean, sometimes it's very tragic, um, and moving. And then sometimes it's, uh, also inspiring and kind of gives, we keep going, keep going because you can often, um, just be, uh, yeah, feel that there is no hope though. I, I feel that there, I have a lot of hope and hope is what guides me, but you know, you can look around and, and, and see that, there are things and systems and processes processes that are within the arts world, but also just like in the world that you live in that are chipping at it and chipping at it and chipping at it. And so what gives you the energy, what gives me the energy to move on is to see that people have been doing it for a really, really long time. Amazing. Nizal, do you want to wrap us up? Um, yeah. You know, when, when I'm up against a wall, I think, the desert has always been a very, very good place to spend some time with yourself. And maybe it sounds horrible because that means that my big source of inspiration is me, but it's not what I mean. There's something about spending a couple of days in this vastness that precises you, that makes you precise and humble again, um, which I enjoy tremendously. I don't know if it's our deep connection to nature, um, so that and and I grew up around horses, and I think that throughout my career, throughout my thinking, the relationship between man and and horses um, is in many ways the same relationship I have towards my art, um, which mm. is profound respect and and humbleness, because it's a big beast that can kill you with one one precise hoof, but it also has an unbelievable gentleness and profoundness that you just need to tap into. Yeah. Um, well, I really do appreciate uh, you both taking the time to spend with us, but also just the amount of work that you do. Um, this performance, Last Ward, is going to be at, at the Art Center at NYU Abu Dhabi. The performance, I believe, is on February. Let me wait until this shows up. I think February 10th. Is that right? Yeah. Did I get that right? Um, yeah, February 10th, 730, which is a Friday at the Red Theater. Um, thank you both for being a part of this. It's a, a real privilege to speak to you both. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.